But I, I wrote down, there's a war for your altar. So you look for somebody next to you and say, there's a war for your altar. You believe that? For your altar. There's a war going on for your altar. And Jesus is going to win the war if you let him. You got to come in behind his cover. You're going in behind him and under him, under the shadow of the Almighty. You're hanging so close to him that you're right in his shadow because you're under the protection of his wings. And if any of this behavior that looks like it could be sketchy, error on the side of being careful. Because a lot of people have started that first step on the slippery slope. I don't have a problem in that area. I can do this. And then all of a sudden, yeah, maybe you do have a problem in that area because your guard is down. And the other thing is your altar is where you worship. <laughs> and I used to worship the Grateful Dead. <laughs> I didn't think of what an ironic thing that that is. Grateful Dead. Now I'm gratefully alive. <laughs> right? I mean, I was telling some people yesterday, uh, one of the guys that I went to a concert with took so much LSD that he went into an institution. As far as I know, never came out. Uh, and, you know, like I, I was standing right next to him, and I could have, you know, there's so many ways that God saved me in the midst of horrifically bad decisions I was making in that whole drug scene world. But I didn't know I was worshiping them, but I drove all over the country. My friends and I took time off of work. We went to Red Rocks in Colorado, and, like, that was a big event. We were going to go see the dead in Red Rocks, Colorado. Like, I have better priorities now than I did then. Okay, we were called deadheads. Shouldn't that have been a warning? <laughs> yeah, but you walk right past them. And everybody else knows there's a problem but you because you're in it and you're caught up in it, right? And he brought life into a dead situation in my life. And he hasn't stopped doing that ever since. It's, it's wonderful. But I had to recognize that was an altar in my life that had to go. And I had a whole big set of albums that I had collected over time and I took them to the garbage truck. I called the office because my family's in the garbage business. I said, well, I, I got to find the nearest truck. And he told me, well, this guy's over on South Street. Bless you. And uh, I drove my truck over to South Street, and I dumped all the albums in the back of the truck, and I ran the thing. You know how that blade comes down? And Because I wasn't giving them to anyone else. That, that was a weapon of mass destruction in the enemy's hands. And I'm saying, no, this deserves to be destroyed. Just like when they brought the books out, right, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and they burned them. Those that had, had been practicing witchcraft, they said, there's no good use for this book. We're going to burn it up. And it's funny that a lot, not funny, it's awesome, that a lot of the rock and roll people of that era got saved. Uh, the guy that sang for Led Zeppelin, Robert Plant. Led Zeppelin was involved in the worst witchcraft, and he saved today. How cool is that? He got on the right stairway to heaven. <laughs> All right, so uh, he just, like, the Lord really hit me this week, and I'm going to just try to convey how he did it, and hopefully it helps you too. But it's really not an easy thing to grasp the fact that God would take that guy that I was that was making really bad decisions and say, not only am I going to save you from that mess so you can spend eternity with me, I'm putting eternity in you right now. You are now the temple. It's not a building anymore. You are the temple. And I'm going to live inside of you, so you better pay attention to me while I'm in there. 24-7. <laughs> I never slumber or sleep, the Lord would say, right? I'm always on duty in you to protect you and to enlighten you, and to reveal secrets to you. But if you ignore me, and you never pray, and you never talk to me, and you never ask, then I'm not going to force myself. I'll let you learn the hard way if you have to, and I sure did in the beginning. So when we read the Bible, we can forget that we've been raised in a Christian country for the most part. It seems to be less so now than when I was younger, but it's right on our dollar bill in God we trust, right? There are still a lot of Christian roots in America, and there's certainly a big remnant across America of people that still love God and are serving him and are praying for our nation. They know the verse that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, purpose to seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. We need to pray that on a regular basis, don't we? So first it starts for our temple, and then we realize, oh, no, 
we're an amazing country that has blessed the world with the missionaries that have gone out from here and the people like Billy Graham, just as one example, that we created a culture that allowed the whole world to be touched by Christianity. It's incredible. But if I'm a first century Jew in Jerusalem, it's a very different world than the one that we live in today. And I'd say for the people in this room, the biggest difference would be how the women are treated. Okay? Even among the Jewish people, the women still do not have standing. They weren't considered equal to the men. We take that one for granted now today. And, and I would agree that there are still times that women aren't always treated equally. But compared to then, massive difference, okay? Jesus is the first one that really honored women as equal partners in, in everything that we do. When, when they wrote the Declaration of Independence and our, and our founding documents, when they said all men, it should have said all men and women <laughs> are created equal, right? You believe me on this? You think I'm getting a little weird? No, the Bible still says that the, the man is the head of the household and that the woman submits to the man, but it also says the man has to love the wife the way Christ loved the church. Which one's harder? <laughs> I think the man's got a harder job. Because it's easy for a woman to love and respect a man if he's loving her the way Jesus loved the church, isn't it? Selah. But I had an option if I was there because I could have gone to these temples. I could have gone to these false idols. And if the Jews weren't going to accept me and I was seeking, I might go to the wrong place. And a lot of the people, like in the Corinthians, when you see Paul writing these letters, he's writing to former pagans. And, and it's not like writing to former Jews who are now Christians. They're not really former Jews. They're just completed Jews that now realize that Jesus is the Messiah. But if you were a pagan, you didn't have all that root system of knowing the Bible. So it was a different kind of angle. And that's why throughout the New Testament you find all these riots Whenever Paul comes into a new area and he says the Gentiles are getting filled with the Spirit just like we are. And people were like, no way. Because after women, Gentiles were not given equal status either. So to think that God would include Gentiles, deadheads, bikers, hell's angels. Like, oh no, that can't be right. Guess what? It's right. <laughs> not only that. Jesus said, they're getting in the kingdom ahead of you, Pharisees. Turn the whole thing upside down. Because now it's about the heart, not about the status, not about the education. You could have all the status and education, and your heart could still be far away from God. You could be that prostitute that just was spared from dying on the street, and you could be the first one to see Jesus coming out of the tomb. Mary, Magdalene prostitute. They cast seven demons at her. She's the first one that sees the resurrected Jesus. That tells you. Flip the whole thing on its head. All the ladies should be getting excited right now. <laughs> Never mind my relatives, the Romans, that were in charge. They were brutal dictators, okay? Brutal. We have what's called the Miranda rights. You know what that is? If, uh, if, if you're arrested, you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. And you have the right to re remain silent. The Romans didn't have that rule. <laughs> right now in China, they don't have that rule. There's plenty of places around the world that still don't do that. So we take things for granted and we forget that we live in a great country where you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. That's awesome. Men, women, doesn't matter who you are if they're following the law. Now there's places in the country that's been violated, but if they're doing what the law says, you're presumed innocent until proven guilty, no matter how bad it looks. Isn't that amazing? It's all from a Christian root. It all started because that's where our foundations are. But the Romans... You only had to step out of line a little bit, and they crucified you. There was one emperor that had 10,000 people crucified at the same time. It stretched hundreds of miles. Like every so often, you'd see another slave, a rebellious slave, crucified. To warn you, if you're coming into our city, this is what happens to people that don't follow the rules. Jesus is saying, Nobody is too far away from me, no matter how bad you've been. If you repent, I still accept you into my kingdom. Flip the whole thing upside down. I wrote down, he brought the super into the natural. <laughs> For me and you. 
He turned us from this natural, faulty person, and he put supernatural inside our faulty, natural bodies. You should be really grateful for that. But we should also get convicted if we get sloppy about it. And we're not taking care of our altar. And I'm talking about me first. It's like, wait a minute. I get one chance in this life. It's my turn right now, right? We could all say that. This is my turn. And not about what are they going to write on my gravestone. I don't want to know that. I want to know what am I going to do today? How am I going to live to try to please the king today? What, how can I look back on yesterday and say, say, I'm not comparing myself to you. I'm comparing myself to me yesterday. And I want to be closer to God than I was yesterday every day. And there's no limit. So keep doing that every day. He said to me, as it is in heaven, I want it to be in you. You are the temple. And as it is in heaven, people used to go to the temple because that's where they believed God met mankind. Now we meet him right in our own heart. 